words. My greatest pleasure is to feel that I've transmitted to my students not my knowledge, but my enthusiasm. I suppose that I am by nature something of a missionary determined to pass on to others what I consider to be important. I have <coughs> I've had some success in this effort of con conversion. This year, for example, the 11 students in a class devoted to reading the no plays surmounted the difficulty of trying to understand often extremely difficult Japanese. They came to sense, despite the often baffling syntax, that these plays contained magnificent poetry. They devoted the necessary time and effort to comprehending the meaning of the text and were able to appreciate the remarkable beauty of the Japanese language of the plays. Surely a teacher could not ask for more. I am fond of the sound of Japanese. This was not necessarily the case from the beginning. The very first time I ever heard Japanese spoken was as a student uh, at Columbia University when I was studying Chinese. No attempt was made to teach students the spoken Chinese language. When I expressed my disappointment at not being able to say anything in Chinese, the teacher suggested that I listen to linguaphone records. The day, one day, I accidentally put on the machine not a, Jap a, 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 a Chinese, but a Japanese recording. Unlike the sleepy voice of the Chinese, I heard a man's voice barking out which sounded like commands. A sudden flash of intu intuition informed me that the man spoke in these tones because Japanese was a militaristic language. <laughs> it did not occur to me for several years that if the recording had been made by a Japanese woman, it would not have sounded in the least militaristic. I have since learned to curb my intuition and to depend more on facts. I think I first appreciated the beauty of the Japanese language when reading Tsurezure Gusa, the work I translated essays in idleness, under my teacher Tsunoda Yurisan. I was so captivated by the sound of the words that I, that I insisted on reading aloud to my friends passages I particularly liked. They protested that they couldn't understand anything. I replied that there was no need to understand. All they had to do was listen to the music of the language. I was unsuccessful in making the friends admirers of the Japanese language, but I fortunately had more success with students. Although I certainly did not know it, I couldn't have chosen a better time to decide at the, as a graduate student after the war that I would make Japanese literature my life work. At that time, say 1946 to 1948, it was commonly opined that it would take at least 50 years for Japan to re regain its pre-war status. Discouraged by this gloomy prospect, most of those who, like myself, had learned Japanese during the war decided that the knowledge of Japanese was of no use. Of the 2,000 of young men and women trained by the Navy and the Army, perhaps 30 or 40 altogether persisted after the war in the study of Japanese. The rest went back to what they had planned to do before the war, and they became lawyers, dentists, pianists, and so on. They lost their Japanese more quickly than they had learned it but they generally remembered a few phrases of Japanese that they had encountered in documents they had translated, such as, Tekio Mizugi wa nitei, Geki Metsuseyo. There were only five or six universities in the whole of the United States where people who wished to pursue their study of Japanese literature could study. I was fortunate and being able to study under Tsunoda Yusaku at Columbia. His main field was Japanese thought, but because in 1946, most of the other teachers of Japanese language and related disciplines 
were in Japan with the occupation, Tsunoda Sensei also taught Japanese literature, Japanese <coughs> history, and so on. Only five or six students had, had chosen to study classical Japanese literature, but their interests were varied. Each wanted to study a different period of Japanese literature. As a result, Tsunoda Sensei uh, taught Heian literature, uh, including chapters of the Tale of Genji, Makwa no Soshi, medieval writing, Hojoki, Tsuraju, Tsurikusa, and two no plays, and Genroku literature, including Koshoku, Gonin, Honna. This was a lot to read in a single academic year, but the students wanted nothing more than, than to study after four years of serving in the war. In the Japanese word, chishikiyoku, a craving for learning, which I think we all possess. When, when today, students don't seem to be possessed of the same feeling, I grow angry. <laughs> because I know how precious it is to be able to study when one, one wishes. It was possible to study all these different kinds of literature because Tsunoda Sensei knew them all, had not the slightest difficulty in reading them. After a year and a half of graduate study at Columbia, where I'd spent my entire university career, I thought I would go elsewhere for a time. My first choice was a university in Japan, but at the time, only missionaries and a, a businessman were admitted by the occupation authorities. Not having any qualifications as either, I decided to spend a year at Harvard. I was rather afraid that Tsunoda Sensei might feel hurt that I'd be leaving at him, but he favored my plan. He considered it was an example of Penzan, a term used of Buddhist priests who traveled from one monastery to another <coughs> to broaden their knowledge. I remember the year at Harvard mainly in terms of my reunion with friends from the Navy Japanese Language School. I also became friendly with Edwin Reischauer, then a youthful assistant professor. But I missed Tsunoda Sensei. While at Harvard, I heard of the Henry Fellowships, grants given to Americans to study in England and to Englishmen to study in America. Preference was given to applicants who plan to study subjects better taught on the other side of the Atlantic Ocean. I reasoned that because of the numerous uh, British contacts with the Near East, that Arabic and Persian would be a considered a suitable language to study. To my surprise, I was granted a year's fellowship to study at Cambridge. Soon after I arrived, I went to see the professor of Oriental Languages. He asked how long I planned to spend in Cambridge. One year was my response. Do you think you can learn Arabic in one year? Yes, I responded, and Persian too. <laughs> I, uh, uh, the professor suggested that I not bother the teachers of the two subjects. I went next to the lecture in Japanese. The, the teaching of Japanese at Cambridge had begun only a few years earlier in response to the Scarborough uh, plan for increasing the teaching of Asian languages in the universities. The teacher, Eric Keel, originally a scholar of Latin, had learned Japanese during the war. We became friends and he asked me to teach Japanese conversation. At the time, there was not one Japanese in Cambridge and extremely few in the entire country. I was a substitute until the Japanese could be found. The teaching of Japanese language at Cambridge began with the preface of the Kokinshu. In terms of teaching the classical language, this made sense. The preface contains very few kanji and the vocabulary is extremely limited. But it seemed strange to me to treat Japanese as a dead language in the manner of Greek or Latin. My conversation classes were rather peculiar. The vocabulary of the three students consisted mainly of 10th century Japanese mixed <laughs> with the words of Mayan Japanese that I taught them. The conversation cl classes were not a success, but they were often very funny. <laughs> After teaching for several months, I was asked if I would not re re remain in Cambridge. 
I have been offered an assistant professorship at an important in American university, but I was so much in love with Cambridge that I declined the American offer and took instead an assistant lectureship at the very bottom of the academic uh, scale at Cambridge. My five years at Cambridge were, in a sense, the most scholarly of my whole life. I was too reserved and too old to participate in the life of the undergraduates. Instead, I spent long hours in the library, mainly reading whatever Japanese books I happened to notice. Reading without a specific purpose was a luxury I would rarely have in later years. Another important feature of my life in England was getting to know Arthur Whaley. His translations of both Japanese and Chinese literature were unique, uniquely beautiful, and I dreamt of becoming the second Arthur Whaley. This did not happen. I became increasingly interest, interested in every aspect of Japanese literature, but correspondingly less interested in Chinese literature. At best, I could only become half of Whaley. Not long ago, I read a book by a contemporary of Whaley's, a gifted writer who wrote several books about his friends. Whaley appeared in one of them as an eccentric scholar who was unfortunately a bore. I was shocked by this characterization. I certainly never thought of Whaley as a bore. It was not only a privilege, but a delight to be in his company. I suppose that he was called a bore because he tended to talk only about matters of interest. He had no small talk with which to regale visitors, and he was unlikely to indulge in, in gossip. On one occasion, when someone who was genuinely a bore paid Whaley a, a visit, Whaley, after a few more minutes of exchanges of dreary former formalities, suggested that his guest and he go into the garden in Gordon Square. The two men went into the garden. Willie produced two books, giving one to the visitor. He suggested that they read on separate benches. <laughs> I never had that experience. On the contrary, we sometimes talked in his study, and not minding the time, went on until it was too dark to see each other. At the time that I first met Willie in 1948, little of Japanese literature